And I'm like, that's it. And then it like got her laughing and then we like, it broke the ice and then it like was a great yeah. interview. But it's tough. You like, that's kind of, I think the job of an interviewer is to like, you got to break them a little bit and you got to like mm-hmm. get them out of that routine of just like answering question after question and like try and bring something new to the table. So that's like my goal in every interview that I go into. Welcome to Queer Talk, the number one podcast to connect you to all of your favorite queer creators and a space where we share our stories on all things queer related. And hey, if you are new listening to this or old listening to this and you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or give us a follow on Spotify. Our guest today is the number one go-to person for gay pop culture on TikTok. She's a radio host for iHeartRadio Canada and Chum1045. You can find her on TikTok at It's Shannon Burns. Please welcome Shannon Burns. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This is good. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you on. I'm getting to all the original people. Like I've I've interviewed so many people and I'm like finally getting back to like the OG people that I had like originally followed. Like probably like top 20 people that I followed when I first got on TikTok and I was scrolling. Like you were one of the first ones. Nice. That's good to hear. I yeah. still, still feel like I'm still like kind of somewhat figuring out TikTok. So to hear that you've like been around for a bit is great. Yeah, it's been a couple months of making videos, so it's fun. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Good to have you on. Um, I thought it was really cool. You've done a lot of um, apartment tours. You're our first Canadian guest. I don't know why I haven't gotten anyone on besides people in the U.S. Maybe just because TikTok is mainly a U.S. based Uh, app, even though it's not owned by the U.S. But you are first international. I like that. (laughs) International podcast. Um, Yeah. I'm in Toronto. So um, it's really good. Your apartment tours are sick. It's funny because I was in the midst of moving and I had seen one of yours like popped up on my For You page and it was like one for a while back. I, I think they resurfaced some of the time. And it was the, the one reason I was like, oh yeah, I gotta get her on. She was on my list. Um, but I recently moved too. Mm-hmm. And so like, it's funny because I never had a place of my own. And so when I saw your stuff, I never really thought about that. Like a lot of things, like when you don't have a place to yourself, some things just like don't matter. Right. you know, or you don't have this, you know, your furniture and all of that stuff. So like when I saw that and I was like, oh my God, this resonates with me. And it didn't like four months ago, but I'm like, oh my God, I have to get this and this little thing and this little thing. And like, <laughs> yeah, I know this is, I think, no, this is my second time living by myself, but it's it. Yeah. You definitely start to think about like, okay, how do I want to decorate your, like this space now that I'm like live by myself, but are you living by yourself now? Is that? I am. Yeah, I, I am yeah. for the first time, which has been really nice and I got this little kitten and I'm just kind of making this place myself. But yeah, the aesthetic is really interesting when you are really, when you're decorating each specific room, not just your own room. You're like, okay, well like the kitchen has to tie into the living room. The living room has to tie into the, the bedroom and like it has to co- be cohesive, but different a little bit. Yeah. I don't know. I got really into it. Yeah. Well, with my apartment, it's literally one room because Toronto is a pretty expensive city to live in. So living by myself, if you do want to live by yourself in Toronto, it's like a good chance that you have a smaller space. So I am literally in a studio apartment. So like for me, I was like, everything just has to be the same. So I was like, yeah. everything's white, <laughs> like decorate with plants. So the only like touch of color is like the green from the plants. But yeah, everything is like very white, very basic. Um, but it's, it's definitely interesting. Like yeah, decorating a place that is so small and such a, yeah, but I have a really weird loft bed, which I found yeah. anytime that I post about it, people are so fascinated with it. So it's like almost become part of like my content is like my weird apartment because my bed yeah. is high up and you have to like climb stairs to get to it, but it's like still a studio. It's, it's definitely bizarre. Yeah. But people like it. So it's good. Yeah. Good content. Good content. <laughs> um, I've seen you do a lot of stuff around pop culture too. Like what kind of got you into a fascination with pop culture in general? So I have just always been obsessed with like celebrities in the world of like Hollywood and movies and shows and everything since I was a kid. So then when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my job for the rest of my life, I was like trying to think about what I was interested in. So then I was like, well, the only thing that I really like, like, I love watching TV. Like, that's just, I just mm-hmm. am obsessed with it. And it's like, it, I don't want to call it like a passion because I feel like that's so cheesy and it's like pop culture, but I just have such a fascination with it. So then I saw that there was um, a college that was offering TV and radio broadcasting. And I always loved radio stations and like, I'm um, getting to talk on the radio. I would like always call into radio stations and stuff. And I was like, how fun would it be to just have a job where my job is to talk about celebrities and like pop culture yeah. all day? 
So then I went to school for TV and radio broadcasting because I like had this love of pop culture. And then I was like, okay, how can I like turn this into a job? And then now luckily it's worked out for me since going to school. I like working radio now. And so much of my work is focused around pop culture and now interviewing a lot of artists. So literally I just feel like my whole life is just like surrounded by pop culture, which is like 10 year old Shannon would be so stoked that I wake up every day and I'm like on TMZ. And that's like part of my job that I do and like talking about Rihanna and Justin Bieber is like what I get paid to do for for work and just because I have such a love for it it's also transpired into like my TikToks and like my Instagram and like everything that I kind of just talk about with people because I find it so fascinating so it's cool that it can like my job can kind of coincide and like go hand in hand with um just like my interests and the other things that I'm posting online so it all kind of yeah. Yeah. It seems cohesive. It seems like it, it kind of involves everything. If you're able to do that stuff, you're gaining knowledge and experience from that, that you can put into your creative pursuits like TikTok, where you can kind of do your own things and they're maybe more LGBTQ plus focused or more personal and things like that. Yeah, totally. Um, and, and when it comes to like interviewing artists, it's so fun too, because it is, it is my job, but also like when I get a certain artist that I, get told by my work that I get to interview or whatever. I'm like, Oh, I already know so much about this person just from like spending, like not being able to sleep at night and like reading things about them online and all. (laughs) So it's like, it really helps having that interest already go into my job. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's a passion project meets something that you actually like, which is something that's really hard for people, especially during COVID in this time. I think, you know, especially like with young people who they come right out of college, maybe they like their degree, maybe they're not using their degree and they're just trying to get a job to get them through to pay to pay for their debt. And so to see someone who's on TikTok, who's a queer creator, who's actually doing the stuff that they want to do, and it's not just like a side hobby, that's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel so grateful and so blessed, especially this year when you see so many people get laid off and like, yeah. And a lot of people see TikTok as like an escape, but it's really just like an extension of what I'm already doing for my job. And it just makes me feel so much more lucky, I think, because this year has really taught us to like put everything into perspective and to reflect a lot on our lives and all of this. So I think first of all, I'm just like so glad to have a job. And then second of all, like be so glad to have a job that I love. And that is like so much a part of who I am. So it's just, it's a really good feeling to be able to, yeah, like have it all. It's great. (laughs) To have it all. Have it all. I'm Shannon Burns and I have it all. (laughs) You know. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I know. I know. Yeah, no, that's super cool. How did you get into this space? Like, because it is such a, it seems like such a dream job. Like how did you, how, what was kind of that path? Cause I'm sure it wasn't an easy one. Like I'm sure it had its ups and downs and things like that. I mean, most people don't see that when they see like, Oh, this, this great thing. Like I'm sure it took a little bit, like what was kind of that journey for you? Yeah. And that's the thing too. Like I'll make TikToks about being in radio and people are like, Oh, how do I get that job? Like, how do I apply? And I'm like, it's yeah. not that easy. you can't just apply. Yeah. Like I've been working like probably a decade now to get to where I am right now. Um, but so I went to school for TV and radio broadcasting in like Niagara Falls area of Canada. So, um, it's like an hour and a half from Toronto where I am now, but then, so I went to school there and then I, um, had to get an internship as I was finishing up school in order to, uh, graduate. So I had to like work at a radio station or TV station or something. And I really wanted to get into radio. So I got an internship in Edmonton, Alberta, which is like on the other side of Canada. And, uh, so I did an internship there. And then from there I got hired at a radio station, just working like in their office in their promotions department. But I was like, at least I'm in, like I'm in a radio station. So I did that for a year and then I really wanted to get on air. Like I, my goal was to always be hosting my own show on the radio. So then I got an offer to move to like a very small town in Alberta, which we call is like the Texas of Canada. It's like <laughs> area of like farmland, ranches, like all that. So it's very, yeah. And then I moved to a small town of like 30,000 people and Canada is so vast too, that it's like very remote when you're in a town like that. Like there's nothing around for hours and hours. So that was just so surreal coming from a place like Toronto in this area where I grew up to then find myself there. There's like two radio stations. I got to host the morning show for a rock station there. I did that for like a year, um, which is, yeah, just so surreal. And like rock isn't really my thing either. So it was just like a total learning experience, but I was like, I got to do my dues. Like I got to like get the experience so that I can like yeah. move one day, all this stuff. So I'd like wake up. What do you mean you're not a rocker? You seem so hardcore to me. Yeah. I got the nose ring. That'll do it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, yeah. Like a nice, like a nice neck tattoo or chest tattoo. Yeah. This, like maybe no tattoos, which I feel like is like, I feel like every queer person has tattoos. Don't you think? I think a lot of, a lot of them do. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's like a, a staple, but I definitely see, I think like, because when somebody comes out, like a lot of those norms go away. So anything that deals with being taboo also goes away too, you know? Mm-hmm. So the masculinity and femininity, everyone's like, fuck that gender binary, like everything, you know, everything's on a scale. And so like with tattoos, it's like, how many do we need? I need a flower one. I need a Zodiac one. It's true. I, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've never actually really thought about it that way. Yeah. And I think like coming out can kind of be like a sense of rebellion in a way too. So it's like, as tattoos might also be. So maybe that's why. I don't know. But anyway, so yeah, rocker girl. Um, I did that for about a year in the small town. And then I ended up getting a job back in Edmonton at a radio station called Virgin Radio. And then from there, I like worked my way up at that radio station over like three years. So I was in Alberta for a total of five years. And then I applied for a job in Toronto at Chem 1045, which is like the biggest, most like heritage station in Toronto. It's been around for like 50 years. Like everybody knows it. I grew up listening to it. Um, And lucky enough, I ended up getting the job, which was just surreal. I couldn't even believe it. So then they were like, yeah, can you move back to Toronto? And I was like, yeah, I'm coming home. This is so sick. And then I've been in Toronto now for about two and a half years at this station. So then, yeah, so I did that. I started at Chem and then... Um, our like umbrella company is iHeartRadio Canada. So they offered me like after I started working at Chum, they're like, hey, we also want you to host a show for iHeartRadio Canada that's going to be syndicated on all the Virgin radios across Canada. So I do two radio shows a day. Um, I do one that I record during the day and then I send it out and then it airs on all the Virgin radios at night. And then I also go in and do a live show on Chum every night. So with iHeart, that's where I get to do a lot of the artist interviews. Um, I get a lot of those opportunities because my show is syndicated. Mm -hmm. So they'll give me those because it'll air so vastly across the country. And then um, also, yeah, be online and all those things. So a lot of things. So so you're a workaholic. You work 24 (laughs) seven. I do. (laughs) I actually like, I, I have to slow down a a little bit I think because I don't know what it is but I just like absorb myself with work mm-hmm. and my therapist tells me I need to like take some time for myself but I just always feel like there's something more to do so I'm just like yeah. okay what can I do like how many TikToks can I fire out today or like yeah. yeah how productive can I be today I feel the same way too like it's something that I have realized in quarantine with myself is like I put a lot of my self-worth into my achievements and if I'm not doing or achieving then I'm like what the fuck what the fuck am I doing with my yeah. life Or I'm like Um, a wasted day if I like don't do something that I feel like I'll remember. That's what I always think of too. And like, then I feel like I've like wasted it. But yeah, it's totally like, I feel like so much of my self-worth is like valued on success. Mm -hmm. So I put a lot of pressure on myself, which I also, I feel like I need to work on a little bit. (laughs) That's okay. I feel like a lot of people are in that same boat. Um, Like quarantine helped me slow down because I ended up, you know, working from home and stuff like that. So I was able to kind of do stuff here and there and like, and, and really kind of hone in on that, on that fact, you know, like, cause I had a job that wasn't, it was supposed to be a really, really awesome job. And then it turned into something that I didn't realize was going to turn into. So I had to deal with that and like not doing a very good job at my job, but I wasn't able to do a good job at it. So it like really fucked with me. Yeah. Oh, it was so frustrating. But it honestly was one of those things where it's like you're in control of it. So you can only be in control of something that you can control, which is not something that I'm good with. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to do the best I can do, even though I know that it's not the best, best, but it's the best I can do right now. And I've had to like completely like reframe how I think about that specific thing. Mm -hmm. And that was like a huge growth moment for me was to be able to like do that. And I know that a lot of our listeners, because I've had questions about that about like not feeling good and coming out of college and like not feeling like you're living up to your potential and shit like that. It is, it is so much of your mindset too. Like it's, there's only so many things I feel like you can change in your everyday life. Like you're saying like the things that you can't have control over. So it's just about how you like process them and register it and like see things for yourself. Yeah. And of course our own worst critics too, right? Oh yeah. We are our own worst critics. Like I always try and like, I mean, I'm not very good at it not gonna lie, but like, I'm always like, what would I tell my friend? Like if my friend was telling me these things, what would I tell my friend? Yeah. And I definitely wouldn't speak to my friend. Like I speak to myself. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh, same. Yeah. I'm like, I would hate to be my own friend. <laughs> you know, like I would ha- Yeah. It's the worst. I'm It'd like be the most toxic relationship I've ever had. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I'm like so mean to myself. And that's another thing I'm working on in therapy. Yeah. Hey, we could just make the whole episode about things that Shannon and I are working on in yes. therapy. This is like a therapy session. I love this. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, uh, like my, like, like I like to like ask questions about 
you know, like, what do you do? And like, you're coming out. Cause like, it is fun. But like the questions that are more fun are the ones that like, are like people's TikToks. You know what I mean? Like the more vulnerable ones, the ones that connect, the ones that make authentic, those kind of, right. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I'd rather fucking talk about that shit. That shit's way more fun to talk yeah, about. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you put me on the spot. <laughs> no, no. And I'm like, shit, I gotta find something deep. But no, not too no. deep. No. To where it's no. uncomfortable. TikTok. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But no, that's that's really interesting. I was ha- I had a, an interview with. Um, do you know who Araya is? She's Oshiga. She's Squish on TikTok. Oh, I don't know. She did the. Uh, I want to park that Big Mac truck right oh, in yeah. this little garage. I just had her on, <laughs> and we were talking about capitalism, Ooh. and so we were talking about back to what we were like. Not to digress, but mm-hmm. um, and retract, but like talking about the need to achieve is like through like capitalism yeah. and how we're all brainwashed to think that like that's how we should view our self-worth is through like how much we achieve and how much we get done in a day. Right. And I feel like it's such like an American slash Canadian thing too. It's like that you can't just yeah. enjoy your life. You have to like work so hard every single day and you're never doing enough. The American Canadian dream, the, the Western dream we'll call it, mm-hmm. which is so weird because I feel like TikTok has helped me get out of that uh, as much as I can, you know, from upbringings and stuff like that, getting out of that and being like, oh my God, I have self-worth even if I do nothing today. Totally. Um, it does give you that like satisfaction too. Like you did something or just even like relating to somebody. You're like, oh, okay, like I made a connection today. Like I did. Yeah. I don't know. It's cool. Yeah. Like it. it's like a good creative outlet as well. I think so. I think so. Do you think it's going anywhere? Like, do you think, like, do, you th- do you think that TikTok is going to be banned? There's been, it's been up and down. I haven't thought it's changing or going anywhere. Like, what really are your thought, thoughts on it? I thought there was like, there was like that one Sunday, like a couple weeks ago or whatever, where Trump was like, okay, it's going to be banned on this day. I really thought that it was going to, yeah. and it has been banned in other countries. So I don't think it's totally out of the realm of possibilities, but it would be devastating to see it get banned. And I really hope that it doesn't, but I think it also has to do like, determined by what happens in the election. You're right. So I think that will be a determining factor. And I also think that Trump also has like bigger fish to fry right now. So I think it's, I don't know, we'll see. We'll see. We won't know until we know, but I really hope that it doesn't. Cause, and everybody in Canada is like, don't worry, it's safe here. But I'm like, but the Americans are the, there's so many American creators. Like what is TikTok yeah. going to be about America involved in it? And I think like half of my followers are Americans. I'm like, I talk to so many Americans on TikTok. So I'm like, it's, it just wouldn't be the same. So yeah, we need you guys. Yeah. Most, there's a lot of, I think the most users are, are in the U S. So, I mean, it would really fuck with TikTok in general because all of, a lot of the users and creators are here. And it would put all the emphasis on you guys. You guys would have to bear the brunt. Can, can, yeah. Canada. <laughs> I was like, okay, at least there's less competition in that way. But also, <laughs> you, know, you take ours. us all out. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, there's no Americans. So I guess we'll just like Canada's ready to rule. Um, but a lot of people are talking about how they, like a lot of Americans say they would move to Canada if TikTok gets banned. So I'm like, all right, let's start our own like hype house in Canada. Let's do it. Yeah, seriously. Everyone says that. There's always been talk like, oh, like, you know, Trump is elected. People are moving to Canada. I actually want to see how many people fucking did that shit. Yeah, apparently um, not a lot. But even after the debate, there was like a spike in Google searches of like Americans looking to move to Canada. So I don't know. My girlfriend lives in America and she says the only reason she's dating me is because I'm Canadian and I'm like a green card for her to get out of the country. So <laughs> she's like, I love you, but I love, I love you more because you're in Canada. Yeah, literally. And she'll tell me that all the time. And I'm like, yeah, I don't blame you. Get over here. I'll save you. <laughs> I'll save you. That's so funny. Some of the TikToks that I liked, especially you had shown like different informative things about like different LGBTQ plus documentaries, a lot of which I hadn't seen. And like, I thought that I saw, like, I've seen a lot of queer film and, and Mm -hmm. even like things where you had your Buzzfeed artist who did little stuff here and there. Like, I really thought I absorbed all of it. And then I saw your TikToks and I was like, there's still so much out there that I haven't seen. Um, maybe because it, a lot of your stuff was Canadian and it's not showing up for me. Yeah. That um, could be I know that there's one, I was like, I posted one clip of a lesbian documentary that I had watched and so many people were like, how do I watch this? And then I realized it was a Canadian documentary. Um, so a lot of Americans couldn't find it online, but yeah, that could be part of it. But I also just like watch a lot of documentaries. Yeah. So I think that, um, could have something to do with it as well. I don't know. Yeah. I, but I just like absorb as much queer content as I can, even though a lot of it is not great. 
Like there's a lot of lesbian movies that are not. Oh my God. It, it, it's really bad. Um, cause I, I usually have a question where I ask someone about their favorite queer movie mm-hmm. and a lot of people say below their mouth and I ask why I'm like, okay, is it because the sex scenes are fire? Because I agree with you on that. Or is it because you actually like the movie in which I, I, I don't know if I can like really argue with you, Yeah. but like, it's awful. The yeah. film and- is awful, but the sex scenes are great. Yeah, the last YouTube video I did was all about, like, lesbian movies, and that was the one movie where I was like, this movie, like, there's nothing good to say about this movie because it's just not good, but, and people will come for you, like, I've had people message me, so, I don't know, I might get it again, but, yeah, Blow Her Mouth is not a good movie, don't watch it, waste your time, unless you just, like, are watching a movie specifically for queer scenes, then there you go, they have a lot of chemistry in that way, but that's it. Yeah. It's yeah. all physical, but there isn't a good story. Like there, the storytelling you can tell is not like the producer and the writer. Someone, there's just more men on it than, than women. And you can see that in like Jenny's wedding too. Have you yeah. seen Jenny's wedding? Yeah, it's horrible. <sighs> and I, and it, you'd think that it would be good because it's like, has such mainstream actresses in it. Yeah. It's Catherine Heigl and Alexis, what's her face? Um, Gladell, I think. Yeah. Gladell, yeah. So you'd think that they would be great, but their chemistry is like so awkward. They look like straight girls pretending to be gay. And it's like, um, really bad. I did just watch the movie Ammonite, which hasn't come out yet. Um, that's the new one with Kate Winslet and Saoirse Ronan that is like, it's like a period piece where they're like age gap, but it's so good. It's like portrait of a lady on fire, but like so much. Yeah. It's so good. But because I, I made a TikTok about that movie because the trailer had come out and I was so excited because Kate Winslet and Saoirse Ronan are like my two favorite actresses. So for them to play lesbians, it's like someone made this movie for me. Um, but I made a TikTok about how excited I was. And then the movie premiered at TIFF at the Toronto International Film Festival here. And they had seen my video. So then they invited me to the world premiere of the movie. So I got to go watch it because of my TikTok. I was like, wow. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. And just because I like love your film. So I was like, this is like the best ever. So I got to be like one of the first viewers to watch the movie, which is really cool. That's absolutely amazing. I saw that when I was doing research for this episode. I saw that you had recently posted that and I hadn't, I hadn't seen that. But like mm-hmm. everyone loves a nice lesbian period drama. You know right. what I mean? So, like, so many of the like that. in that video are people being like, why another lesbian period drama? Like, people want modern, I think, now. And the fact that it's age gap. People have a lot of problem with that because we've seen it before. So it's like, people want something new. But I don't know. Yeah, but like, I, I, don't, I don't know. I might have to disagree with you because like, everyone's obsessed with Sarah Paulson. Oh, that's a trailer. No, and that's I, a big ass age gap. Like, that's the biggest age gap, I think, right now in the, in the celesbian also- scene. Yeah. But that's another thing. That's like the first TikTok that I made that blew up really big was just showing cute photos of Sarah Paulson and Holland Taylor because I'm obsessed with them and I love a good age gap. Like I am Mm -hmm. a sucker for a cute lesbian age gap. So I love them. But so many of the comments at the same time, like one of the top comments is like, that looks like her grandma or that looks like her mother. Like this is disgusting. And I think, and I, I don't know, I have such a problem with it too, because I just feel like the LGBTQ plus community is all about equality and acceptance and people within the queer community are so quick to judge other people in the queer community that they don't agree with, which I think is so bizarre because we have all fought for like our rights. So it's like, Mm -hmm. why are you all of a sudden, as soon as something is that you don't like, like an age gap couple or anything like that, people are like, that's disgusting. And I'm like, you sound like the straight people who talk about gay people. Like it's crazy. Well, you're one and the same. If you're willing to judge someone for something that they're, they're like going to judge you, you know, you're both judging each other for things that you find uncomfortable or are out of your realm or something that you didn't grow up with or that you don't, you're not, I don't say woke, but you're not, you're, it's, you're ignorant. So it's like, yeah, it, I fucking hate that. Yeah, it's so annoying, especially when we fight for like love is love, but then they're like, oh, accept that or accept like, yeah, it's just, it's hypocritical and people need to chill out. Yeah, it's like, just because you wouldn't do it, just because you wouldn't fuck Holland Taylor doesn't mean that Sarah Paulson doesn't want to fuck Holland Taylor. (laughs) Seriously, any of them, honestly, either or. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if a 40-year age gap is my cup of tea, but, like, go for it if you want to. You know, like, no judgment. Everyone has their preferences. Seriously. But but Sarah Paulson, I mean, at, like, a 15-year age gap, a 10-year, ah, like, yeah, like, 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 yeah. And people act like they could, like, get Holland Taylor at the end. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, Holland Taylor probably doesn't like you either, so chill out. Yeah. (laughs) And you know what? Sarah Paulson doesn't like any of us because obviously she goes for older people. Yeah, yeah, I know. But Sarah Paulson, she's the best. God, I love her. I I feel like, and I had this conversation with with Araya too, but, like, she 
um, was in a, a movie before she was famous, like from American Horror Story. It was with um, Julianne Moore. Yep. Uh, I forget what it was called, but she played a, a queer character that was like coming out, like trying to come out to the family. Um, she was like a supporting, supporting character in it. I forget the name, but it was like, um, Julianne Moore is someone with disabilities and she falls in love with another guy with disabilities. What? I gotta watch this. I love it, Julianne. I think it was an Academy Award winner or something. It won awards. Okay. Okay. Um, it was in the 90s. I think it was in the 90s or early 2000s. Okay. And she plays a queer character in it. Oh, amazing. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's crazy, too, because a lot of people didn't even know that Sarah Paulson was queer until, like, recently. Until, like, more people started learning about her and Holland Taylor's relationship. But all the gays knew. We all knew. Because we looked into it. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Any, any gay, any sign of a gay, we're like, oh, one of us. Welcome. Okay. Like if you, I don't know if you're a U.S. Women's National Team fan, but I'm a big fan because I grew up playing soccer. Mm -hmm. And like I, I knew that um, Ashlyn and Allie were uh, were hooking up for sure. Yeah. And like there were so many things on it, and they didn't actually like, come out, come out, but like they 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 kind of did. You know what I mean? Everyone's like, oh my god, I had no idea. Like they were teammates, and I'm like, how did you not know? Yeah. And they're girls who play soccer. Like how, if you've been on a girls' soccer team, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not super gay. We're not like the basketball or the softball, you know, but we're, we're up there. There's at least 10% of a team. Yeah, that's a lot. Basketball, I'd say is 25, um, speaking from experience. <laughs> and softball is probably like 40 to 50%. Yeah, I think that's even easy for softball, maybe even a little more. Yeah. Like the lesbian sport. <laughs> but no, I... I think it's, I think one of your TikToks was really good about the one documentary with, I think it was a Canadian documentary. It was the Forbidden Love one. Oh yeah. 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 That's one of the ones that I saw that I didn't know existed. And I watched it. It was, you know, like right at the beginning of quarantine and um, I watched it. I like paid for it and okay, it was that awesome. Referring to. That's the one that I was saying that like, um, that was a Canadian documentary I realized. And so many people were like, how do I find this? But that's good. You could at least pay for it and watch it. But it's oh, so yeah. It was on Amazon Prime, but oh, yeah. um, it's funny because I, I saw the books that they were referring to, like the only lesbian books that they had. They like talked about in the documentary about like buying as many as they could mm -hmm. and how they thought all the lesbians lived in, was it like um, Greenwich Village or? Oh yeah. There's like certain New York. areas of New York City. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Certain areas of New York City that there were, and like so many different like archetypes and like I started realizing I bought those books. I have one. Hold on a second. I like completely forgot that I had these. Um, I bought them used and I literally saw them and I bought like four or five of them. Oh, so these, yes. oh yeah, so these are the books that like they would read because it's all they had. Yeah, it's all they had. And I thought it would be interesting to get into the perspective of like them just like soaking in these books that like promote what we think now are like really toxic, um, toxic masculinity in the, these, you know, butch femme ideals. But like to them, it was all that they had. And a lot of these writers, when I look at them, some of them are women, but like some are men. Really? Yeah. No way. Oh, I want to yeah. read that. I know. I have a few of them. I got them off of like thrift books or easy books oh. or something like that. And they were, they're good decor too, but um, yeah, I've read a few of them and, and it is really interesting. I forget which one, which book that I read, but like, it was talking about like a toxic relationship with like the masculinity and the femininity and what they were talking about in the documentary where you had to either be a femme or, or a butch. That's, that's the one part of the documentary that stuck out to me the most. And I remember watching it and I was like, um, cleaning my kitchen or something. And I stopped and I was like, wait, what? Like, and you either had to be a butcher or a femme and you couldn't be anything else. And you couldn't date two femmes couldn't date and the two butches couldn't date. That's like yeah. their, that's how they thought things were. It was so bizarre. Yeah. And in one of these books, it outlines that. So that's, it like is reaffirming those things because this book is about like this toxic relationship between this between two women who are like that. And it goes down to just such the gender because in the fifties, it was so big with, you know, boys in blue and girls in pink. And it was like so much more rigid during that time period than any other time period, I feel like. And it, it really showed in those. And so like reading those books, 
and like reflecting on, oh my God, like this is why is because books were reinforcing this. And the people who were reading these books also thought this, it's like, come on, it's like a whole thing. That's crazy that it was like that. Yeah. And like reinforcing that fact, but actually watching that documentary made me want to read more and get more into what being gay in that time was like. So I read this book afterwards called Stone Butch Blues, which was just the exact same time period and talked about a lot of the same things. And a huge thing that stuck out with me for that was that a lot of women in this time when they were at the bars, if it got raided, police officers would go to the butch women. And if they weren't wearing a certain amount of feminine clothing, they would get arrested. Wow. And that was like against the law. So they had to like wear clothes underneath their clothes to like prove that they were women and like still representing being a woman in order wow. to not get arrested. Isn't that? Oh my that God. Crazy? That's so fucked up. Yeah. And so listeners, if you guys are listening to this, check out thrift books. I'm going to put the description down below and I would check out authors like Ann Bannon. She rates a lot of them. I wouldn't take any of what they're saying as fact, just like I wouldn't take anything I say or any guess I say on here as fact. But they are really good books to just tell you what it was like to be to be gay in the 50s and, and all of the things that we fought for and, and why we are able to have so much freedom of who we are now. Not that it's the best it can be, but it's way better than it was before. Yeah. True. And just like getting those reminders, I'm sure is really nice too, to like just see exactly how far we've come. Exactly. And not everyone can have friends that live in the area. And I feel like that's really cool. Um, I'm going to segue into this, uh, Shannon, but like you have long distance friends. And I think that is something that's so cool. We always talk about, you know, the whole lesbian trope of like long distance relationships and all of that stuff and, and you hauling and shit like that. And, and while that stuff is fun, I think it's really cool that you've cultivated long distance friendships because I feel like people don't take friendships as seriously as they take romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. But that's a good thing about our friend group is like we take pride and we make it a priority in our lives. And that's what we've all talked about too. So it's really nice because it almost like feels like a relationship in the way we like make sure that we're all like in contact and we're all, we got our group chat and we like are constantly, we like, especially now with COVID it's only brought us closer together because of zoom. Like we never did group online hangouts before then. We would just like, we have this pact where every six months we go on a trip all together and we've stuck to it for the last like five years. So just the fact that we have zoom now and like, we'll have like our Friday night zoom hangouts and we all get drunk on zoom and it like actually feels like we're all hanging out as friends. So it's really, really sweet. But yeah, yeah. I got a long distance group of friends. They're all American except for myself. So they're all over the place too. It's great. <laughs> you like Americans. That's what I'm, that's what I'm gaining from this. Everyone's I, do, I love America. Yeah. And I think that goes into my fascination with pop culture. Cause like as a kid, I was like America, like every movie you watch is American and American high schools and like Hollywood and like all this stuff. So I was like, I want to live in America one day. But then, um, now I don't, I'm very happy in Canada, but I do yeah. love my Americans. Yeah. Great people. Good. I think everyone idealizes America, especially if you've never been, you know what I mean? Like I've lived in different countries and like, they really like, they see Westerners. I'm not just going to say like white people, they just see Westerners in general, all different races. And they assume that, you know, we live in California or Florida or New York. Exactly. Yeah. And you know? I too. I'm like, oh, Cincinnati. Like, that's even one I'm like, I don't even know where that is exactly. <laughs> so you, there's so much to the states too. Like, there's so many cities. So it's like, yeah, you guys got a lot, a lot going we, on. Definitely. We got a lot going on. But yeah, everyone, I think, idealizes it because they see everything that they see films and film is typically from, you know, it, I don't know if it originated, maybe originated or in the US, you know, with Hollywood and things like that, but it's definitely the most prominent one. It influences like how we see the country and like, yeah, life and all the things. So, yeah. yeah. I think it's funny because I always, when I think of Canada, like I don't think of it as an extension of America, more of like a sister of yeah. America because I, and so it's kind of funny when you talk about America, it does it, it feels weird to me because I'm like, I feel like Canada is very, like very similar. It is, um, it is similar in a lot of ways, um, especially like, even going to certain cities, like my girlfriend lives in Chicago and going to Chicago, I'm like, this feels exactly like Toronto. Like it's yep. very similar. Um, but there's obviously some, some differences as well, but it like overall, it's really not that different. There's just not a lot of Tim Hortons. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know if the maple syrup isn't as good. I'm not yeah. sure. I apologize. Here, better selection of chips. I could, um, yeah, go on and on about Canada. Big fan. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's super cool. Um, you talk about some TikToks where you talk about like your favorite people that you've interviewed. Mm -hmm. But my question is, what are some of the people that you've interviewed that you kind of came in thinking they were going to be one way and either they were completely different, you were pleasantly surprised, 
like either way, like who were those people that you originally thought were one thing and they ended up being something else? That's a really good question. Okay, wait, I know that there are artists where I'm like, I had like, I knew that, or I like knew that they had a reputation for like not being so nice and then they were, but wait, let me think for a second. Okay. I caught you off guard. I, know, I, I love it. So had a good, good question for a uh, radio host. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. I don't know. I don't know. Because I feel like overall artists are like nice. Like that's why they are the people that they are. Mm -hmm. But, and I don't think I've ever had, I've had artists that I thought would be nice and then weren't. Um, but we don't have to get into that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not trying to get you fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Who's an artist that I didn't. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can name one off the top of my head because I do a bunch, but there are artists that I've interviewed that, oh, that's why they're that famous. Like that's, they are good. Like they are yeah. smart and they are so kind and so sweet that you're like, yeah. oh, you are just like, yeah. I'm like, that's why you are like the biggest pop star in the world. So now I'll name drop a few. Um, sure. <laughs> Go Taylor. for it. Yeah. Um, Taylor Swift was like the sweetest, nicest person that I've ever met, like artist or not. She's just like a kind soul. And as soon as you like talk to her, you're like, oh, that yeah, it's a perfect example of that. I was like, I can see why you are as famous as you are because she just like gives you her undivided attention. She's just so lovely and is just very nice. And like you, there's nothing that you can say that would like upset her. And she'll just like, I don't know. She's just great. And the thing about hers is that and I've never had this too. So I did, I did a phone interview with her and she had asked for a photo of me and two fun facts about me. So she could feel like she got to know me before we did our interview. And I was like, who does that? That is yeah. like so sweet. I've never had any artist like care or think of that or anything like that. And then Ed Sheeran is another example of that too. As soon as I met him, I like walked in the room and he's like, Hey, how's it going? He's like, Shannon Burns, like, what's your story? What's going on? Like, as we're like getting our mic set up and stuff, just like he acts as if he's like an old friend that hasn't seen you in years. And then you're yeah. just sitting down and like catching up and like, it's just, yeah. That's so just cool. Unbelievable that you're like, okay, that's why, that's why you're as successful as you are. And that's why it's so well deserved too. Yeah. Cause I think, um, yeah, you're not going to get anywhere unless you like treat other people with kindness. So I think that's like something that I've taken away from a lot of the interviews that I've done. I'm like, okay, just treat people with respect mm -hmm. and love and compassion and kindness. And like, you'll go a long way. Yeah. Yeah. That's super awesome. Yeah. I saw that when you talked about Taylor Swift and I feel like I see that authenticity with her too, mm -hmm. that she really wants to do, to do good and stuff. And I feel like that's probably why they're friends. I feel like her and Ed Sheeran are, I don't know enough about pop culture. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not like super into it, but. And I made that connection to you. Like, oh, they must like have learned that from each other or like, um, see, like see that in each other too. But Taylor Swift, yeah, there's so many little things that she does too. She'll like send her fans like random packages or like homemade gifts and that she just like, she sees someone on Twitter that's a huge fan and she'll like go out of her way to like write them a letter and mail it to them. And like these little things that like other artists don't necessarily do. So yeah. I saw um, something where she, I don't remember what, I, what video it was, but like how she built her, her following when she was just starting out and that it really was a ground roots effort. Like she had, like, it was like one, you know, just like one person individual. And then it like, it rose out like from the people, like similarly to like Justin Bieber a little bit. Yeah. Um, but hers, I just feel like is, is a little bit different than that, than the demographic that he, that he was doing. Um, you know, he did the whole not boy band thing, but you know what I mean? Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And that like having that grassroots, I mean, it really makes you feel like you know, somebody who's so famous, internationally famous gives a fuck about you. And it's because she does. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's another thing that I've learned with doing interviews. It's like, you can see through people's authenticity so much like it's, and it's something that you need to have if you want to like gain an audience, like you have to be authentic or people are going to see right through that. Mm -hmm. So if you have that, then you're going to go so far. Yeah. That's super interesting. And that's cool that you took that away from your interviews, like what success looks like, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm sure like the people who like weren't very nice, you can probably connect some things with that, like, oh, that's why that they're this or they're this or, or something like that. And then with a bad day, that's what you have to understand too, because you like, and there's a lot of artists who are like doing interview after interview for like days straight. So if you, and you have 10 minutes with them to like get them to try and open up to you and it's really difficult. Like, so you can't always just blame the artist because you have to like understand that they have, they're probably exhausted and they like have so much going on. So I never try and take anything. Yeah. Like personally, but I've never had an interview like that where it has been like mean or anything like that, like knock on wood. Um, but yeah, I've been like really lucky so far, but yeah, it's crazy.
Do you get a lot of interviews where people are on those like PR tours where they're either, you know, doing an album tour or a movie tour or something like that? And you feel like it's kind of like they're going through the motions and you're kind of having to just kind of like boom, boom, boom. And they say boom, boom, boom. Or do you have more people who are like really into it? Like they, they want to connect, they want to, they like, they're really authentic about it. it. There's definitely a mix of both. And sometimes it like, it depends on the questions that you ask as well. So I always try and come up with stuff that like, isn't the typical, like, what's the inspiration behind this album or blah, blah, blah. But you also have to get those sound bites too. So it's like, I do have to add, like, I'm talking to them majority of the time because they have something to promote. So I get those questions out of the way. And then I always try and like get something good out of them as well. Like an example I have of that is Demi Lovato. I did an interview with her and she was promoting her documentary that had come out a couple years ago. And she was, I asked her all my questions and she gave me such a short answer for every single one. And it was such a generic answer. I was like, tell me about this. And she's like, this and this and this. And then that was it. And I had gone through my questions in the first five minutes and I was like, okay, I have another five minutes to fill. Like, what am I going to ask her? So then I was like, I asked her, I think I asked her if she was like in the Illuminati. And then I asked her like just all these random things. I was like, what can I come up with? Yeah. And then as soon as I like twisted it a bit and like got asked her some weird stuff, like there's this celebrity dating app called Raya. So I was like, I hear your yeah. documentary, you talk about being on Raya. She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, what's your opening line when you like message somebody that you match with? And she's like, uh, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, that's it. And then it like got her laughing and then we like, it broke the ice and then it like was a great yeah. interview. Yeah, but it's tough. You like, that's kind of, I think the job of an interviewer is to like, you got to break them a little bit you got to like mm -hmm. get them out of that routine of just like answering question after question and like try and bring something new to the table. So that's like my goal in every interview that I go into. I think that's awesome. I've heard of Raya and I think that's funny because I feel like she probably thinks that's all she has to do because she's Demi Lovato. You yeah. know what I mean? Like she can just say, Hey, how are you? You know what I mean? Like if you're like the hottest girl on hinge, you're probably yeah. not going to message first and no. you're probably just going to say, Hey, you know, yeah, I don't think they do that with their I'm eyes, like, but I'm like me on a dating app and I'm like, okay, how can I be witty, funny and cute at the same time? And yeah, this and this, but yeah, if you're doing a lot of, you don't have to work for it and she's single again. So she's hot as fuck. She's so hot. <laughs> oh, God. Let's love her <clears throat> too, eh? Yeah. I, oh man, like the whole body positivity. She's yeah. thick. What more could you want? Seriously. Great girl. <sighs> Crazy. All right, guys, questions with the queers. We have a question from Anonymous. I'd like to stay private, um, but they are 22. They write, hi, I'm gay. I like girls. I really like girls, but I've been with a guy for three years, and I really do love and care about him so much, but I know this isn't for me. I'm 22 and just don't want to regret never living. I want to go on dates with girls so bad, and I just want to make girl friends and go out and be in the lesbian community, but no one knows I like girls like that, and girls can never tell if I'm flirting with them. Please help me. You want to take the reins on this one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you're doing a whole stream of conscious here, Anonymous, and I get it. Like, I completely understand. Yeah, I don't know about you, Shannon, but like, I, I had dated men before this. Um, and, and I remember like thinking that I really liked them and I, and I think maybe in some capacity I did, you know, like emotional, physical, all of that. There were a couple ones that I actually did like on that level, not to the level of women now that I've had that experience, mm -hmm. but what I would have to say is you can care about somebody and also let them go. So, you know, if, if you do love and care about this person so much, but you're, you're wanting more and you're wanting something different then that person may not be for you. Um, I would probably ask yourself the question, like, if you didn't love this person or care about this person, like, what were your reasons would be for staying? And if you, let's say, had those things, you had the lesbian community, you, you know, girls were flirting with you and they knew that you were flirting with them and it was that kind of thing, like, would you still be holding on to this relationship? But yeah, if you like this when you care about this person, like, you gotta let them go because they, you also want that person that you're with, this guy, to, to fall in love and be with someone who really wants to be with him. I think that's the, you know, one of the highest forms of care and love is to let someone go for, for happiness reasons. And, and I think you guys would both maybe benefit from that. This is unqualified advice. Um, <laughs> you know, take it with a grain of salt. But that's kind of the things that I would ask myself. Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head. And I think that's something too, especially if you see yourself or like want to 
experiment in other ways and you don't feel yourself fully in this, I say, go for it. The fact that you're 22 years old, I think if you stay in the relationship with him and then I think you might grow to resent him possibly, or I think, especially if you don't get those experiences that you want to go for, I say like, just trust your gut and go for it. I think one of the best things that I did was like, I was in the closet for a really long time. So I never wanted to like try anything or do anything. So then I sat on it for a long time and I like didn't do anything. And I like feel like I wasted time. So I feel like, yeah, being 22, like you want to go out there and you want to experiment, especially if you haven't been on dates with girls and that's something that you really want to try. You never know how much, uh, how gay you really are unless you like really go for mm-hmm. it. Right? You like yep. you're saying with dating girls, like you can have this feeling with a guy. And that's how I felt like I dated one guy in high school. And I was like, oh yeah, this is pretty good. But then as soon as I like kissed a girl or went on a date with a girl or had a crush on a girl, I was like overwhelmed with like the amount of emotions that I could feel. And I was like, oh, this is what everybody's talking about. So I think by, and that was just from having experiences. So if you have the opportunity to go out there and, and live those experiences and it could be tough because people don't know that you're flirting with them, but like we live in 2020, like go online, like there's go on TikTok, Mm -hmm. like how many lesbians are on there? Like, yep that will immediately know that you're also gay. So there's so many ways to like meet girls these days. And, and that'll only lead to like then hanging out with them in person. Like I've made queer friends in Toronto from TikTok, which has been like beneficial to my just like friendships that I've made. So there's, yeah, there's many ways to do it. So I say, yeah, go for it. And totally your point about like not being with someone if you're not fully in it, because you don't want him to have to like suffer through being in a relationship that maybe you don't want to be in when he could be with somebody that is better fit for him. I agree with that fully. I also made queer TikTok friends. Apparently there's a lot of queer TikTokers in Ohio, probably because there's nothing to do in Ohio. Um, (laughs) Really makes the the creative juices run. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a great place. It's a great place to meet people, even if you don't want to make videos, you know? If making videos, I feel like is, is nice because people get to know you and build a rapport with you without ever having to meet you. Um, and then you can kind of kickstart that, but like you can meet people. I know so many people who don't make videos that have met people on TikTok. And there's also so many people who are into femmes. Hey, hello. (laughs) Hi. I, (laughs) not hitting on you anonymous. I'm just saying I'm one of those people. Um, (laughs) like there are, and I think that it's such a, like when I've spoken with people on this podcast who, who identify as, as a femme, you don't have to identify as anything, but they, they, they talk about that there are some struggles with that because you can be perceived as straight. But yeah. I think getting on and, and making sure you have, you know, a little rainbow in the bio and, and you know, make it known. I mean, I make that shit known and I feel like I look like it. So. Yeah, you gotta sometimes too. I know, I always feel like even online, like on Instagram or anything, I'm always like have to hint or like bring it up in conversations with people that I meet because right off the bat, like I don't look gay. So it's always something that I like have to slip in and it always helps when I'm in a relationship too. Cause I can just be like, Oh, my girlfriend. Exactly. But yeah, just throw that you like listen to girl in red in your bio. And like everyone will know, you know, exactly. Exactly. I feel like you can never lay it on too thick. <laughs> That's true. You can't you know? show people's faces enough. Exactly. But I do, I feel like I do that when I am meeting people that I don't know or like online, I, I always want to bring it into the conversation. So like people fucking know, A, because it's a litmus test. I want to see people's reactions and then I can gauge if I'm going to pursue any type of friendship or acquaintance with them. If they're like obviously uncomfortable, I'm like, oh, okay, we're going to get away from that. Or if it's someone that's in the community, you know, it's a, it's a nice litmus test. Totally. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's like an immediate connection, especially when you meet another member of the LGBTQ plus community, like right off the bat, I always feel like I'm like, it's like a friend. I'm like, oh, we have this thing in common and then we can like talk about our coming out experience. Like we, you already know right off the bat, you have a lot in common. Exactly. So then it just like kickstarts a relationship or friendship. Yeah, it does. There's always shared trauma. You always can talk hey. about <laughs> shared trauma. <laughs> trauma. <laughs> um, but yeah, listener, I hope that you guys are listeners. I hope that you guys got a lot out of that. Anonymous, if you're listening, I hope you got a lot out of that. But yeah, right now we're going to go to the flash questions for hey. Shannon. So Shannon, you have to answer these questions really fast. Are you ready? I'm stoked. Let's do it. Yeah. If COVID wasn't happening and you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Um, Chicago, because I have been dating my girlfriend for five months and we have yet to see each other in our relationship. (gasps) Wow. So it's really long distance. Like you've never, oh my goodness. Yeah. So we like haven't even, we've been dating for, yeah, almost five months. But she, we've been best friends for like six years. So we've seen each other. Like we saw each other in January, but we haven't yeah. seen each other as girlfriends, which is just. No way. Yeah, I feel so shitty because I'm going to Chicago this weekend. Oh, screw it. Go kiss her for me. <laughs> I'll be like, Morgan, <laughs> Bree's coming over. 
<laughs> Hello, I will be, this is, this is platonic for me, but I'm really just trying to help you guys out. <laughs> oh my God. I love Chicago. Chicago's the best. I love it. Yeah, it's great. Doc Martens or Vans? Ooh, good question. Doc Martens. Okay. I'm a Canadian girl. We got a lot of snow, so you got to get your feet <laughs> out, you know? Exactly, exactly. Flannels or Hawaiian shirts? Hawaiian shirts. Hey. Or flame shirts. That's what I'm into lately, too. Flame shirts. All like, right. Yeah, like Guy Fieri or however you say his name. Guy Fieri vibes. Yeah, that's what I like. Like that's not bad. Up. Yeah, open shirt, t-shirts. Love it. Okay, let's go. Last song you listen to on repeat. Oh, I have been listening to a lot of Tegan and Sarah because I interviewed them yesterday. So I was like really getting the vibe of Tegan and Sarah. So I like read their book this week and have just been like listening to them nonstop. So that's been a lot of repeats. Tegan and Sarah is like OG lesbians. I know. Artists, you know? Seriously. That's why I felt like it was like a badge of honor to get to interview them. I was like, my Canadian lesbian queens, thank you. What is it? Get a little closer. Uh, something like that. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was really good. Thank you. It's the shoulder <laughs> thing. Favorite queer movie. Is this a hard one for you? I have to say Ammonite because I just watched it, but it changes all the time. So I feel like there's not like one movie that I could say. Maybe also, but I'm a cheerleader because that was the first one I ever watched and I love Natasha Leone. Yeah, that's a really tough one. Natasha Leone is awesome. See, Elise, not everyone says Portrait of a Lady on Fire. She gets really, not mad, but she's like, every time you talk about Portrait of a Lady, and I'm like, because that's everyone's favorite movie, and it's mine, so I it's talk about so it. It's so good, and it's definitely up there, so sorry, Elise. Um, yeah, <laughs> that one is in there, and it's just because it's French, and it's just like, I don't know, sucker for a period piece, but yeah, there's a lot. I could go on about it for a while. But yeah. I literally have a lesbian friend who is French, like straight off French, and she does not like it. And I was like, you I would like to know why? Because there's, what is there not to like? I was like, what the fuck, man? You just ruined that whole fantasy. Thank you. <laughs> Big Spoon or Little Spoon? A uh, Little Spoon. Even ah. though I'm, really, I'm a very tall person, so it like is funny that I am a Little Spoon, but yeah. You're really tall? I'm like 5'9", almost 5'10". Yeah, 5'9". Really? Nine. That's crazy. Yeah. I know. Awesome. Halloween or Christmas? Halloween. I feel like Christmas has a lot of expectations. Like there's always a lot of pressure and like family. Yeah. A lot, a lot of family. So, which can be very overwhelming. And I, I'm a sucker for a costume. I love dressing up. So Halloween all the way. Gays love Halloween. Gays do love Halloween. There's something in there. There's something I in know. there. Yeah. Uh, last question, giving presents or getting presents? Oh, giving. I'm very awkward with getting. It's like not one of my love languages at all, but I love giving. And my biggest thing right now is like putting together like packages of little things for my girlfriend. So I'll always be like collecting little things. And then maybe like once a month or something, I'll like send her a box full of little things. And she does the same with me. So it's like our Aww. way of being able to do anything in a relationship. That's so cute. Um, but yeah, I love giving gifts. I'm like, I'm, I already have my Christmas list ready of what I'm going to like buy everyone. So. Oh, that's awesome. You're so prepared. I'm trying. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on this podcast, Shannon. If you want to check out more about her, you can find her at It's Shannon Burns on TikTok. And as always, you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a rate on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a little review. That's it for this episode, my queers. Thank you for listening and subscribing. Be you, be queer, stay safe, and we will see you on the next episode.